quiet, folks. So at this point, I will call to order the July 8th, 2021 meeting of the Spokane Park Board. Welcome, everyone. We have sort of done a roll call as we have, or I have, as we have been um, checking people in. So I will say simply that we are still hoping that Sally Lodato and the kids can join us at some point. Kevin Brownlee is absent excused. Everybody else is here. Any public comment? Sally's here, Jennifer. Oh, Sally. Hooray, Sally. Thank you. Gotcha. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Nicholas Hammond has joined us. All right. All right. Hearing no public comment, I'll move us on to the consent agenda. Uh, park board members, you have in front of you three items. Does any park board member want an item to be removed from that list for discussion? If no. not, I, I will make a motion that we um, adopt all the consent agenda items as presented. Do I have a second? I'll, I'll second, second that. I have two seconds. Great. Okay. Uh, any further discussion on that? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The consent agenda passes as presented. I do want to note that we have present today with us um, Monica Tenasket, who is a Spokane Tribe Councilwoman. We are honored to have her here today. Um, we will hear from her a little bit later. And we also have as a guest Kelly Brown, who is the Friends of Manitou President. And she will be our member of the uh, Citizens um, <clears throat> Advisory Committee for the Development and Volunteer Committee, lots of committees. Um, and we'll be attending probably as a guest, probably as a guest. to um, just get a uh, heads up about what's coming down the pike. And Hannah has joined us. Hannah, delighted. Good to have you here. Glad to be here. Sorry, I'm a minute late. No worries. All right. Well, Mr. Buting, why don't we go ahead to the financial report and budget update? All right, well, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me share my screen. It's hard to believe that we are halfway through the year already. All right, can everybody see that, Brian? Is that all right? Okay, good. All right, well, here's our financial report. Budget update through the month of June. Looking at our first slide here, we see a comparison of our park fund expenditures through June of this year compared to the two year historical budget average. Our expenditures through June are, are actually very quite close to the budget. Uh, the actual expenditures of about 7.2 million is approximately 96% of the historical budget. Uh, actual expenditures have surpassed last year uh, as activities continue to open up and, and you know, we get we're conducting more activities. And our 2021 year to date expenditures um, exceeded the 2020 year to date expenditures by about $440,000. So that's, that signals the opening up of, of a lot of our other activities. So moving on to the second slide, looking at revenues. Um, in this slide, we see that our actual revenues exceed the historical budget by about $560,000. Our year-to-date revenues exceed the 2020 total by over $1.1 million. This reflects significantly greater revenues from parks activities, uh, particularly at River, Riverfront Park and in, in the recreation program. And this total also reflects an additional $220,000 transferred from the general fund to the park fund to support the aquatics program. And that, that amount was posted in June. And then our last graph for the parks fund, here we see the comparison of year-to-date revenues to year-to-date expenditures. Total revenues have exceeded the expenditures by about $2.6 million, and this is about $700,000 more than last year at this same point in time. Are there any questions or comments on the park fund before we move to the golf fund? All right, hearing none. 
And then we see here in the Gulf Fund that expenditures through June exceeded the historical budget. Uh, the actuals exceed, exceed this budget for a couple of reasons. Um, the, av the historical budget average here was brought down because expenditures last year, of course, were significantly reduced due to COVID closures. So that actually brought the average down. This year, the courses have been open and quite busy. Uh, many of the costs of, in the golf program are variable, so they increase with the activity on the courses. Also, there were some significant costs related to the storm cleanup and repair and catching up on some deferred maintenance. So, but we can see it's been a good year at the golf courses. Here we see the revenues exceeding the historical budget average by approximately 45%. 2021 revenues exceed last year by over $700,000. Now, again, note that this total includes the amount for the facility improvement fee, and then just the, the, the improvement fee exceeds the 2020 year-to-date total by about $170,000. And then the graph here comparing expenditures to revenues, this um, Total 2021 revenues have ex exceeded expenditures by about $1.4 million. Now, the net revenues, which of course are revenues minus expenditures, in 2021 exceeds the 2020 total by about $670,000. So even though the costs have increased due to the increased activity, the revenues have outpaced that increase in costs. Any questions on the golf fund before we take our last look or our last slide? All right. In our last slide, we look at the 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 uh, the, the June um, end or end of month June of the, uh, the Riverfront Bond Project, and we see that we have uh, expended and committed about $68 million. We have a remaining unencumbered balance of about $151,000. So that is the, the we can see we're, we're, we're closing in on it. So we're closing in on the end. So any other questions or comments before we? Good to see that number going down. Yes. Very much. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very and much. Good job, golf. <laughs> but we'll hear more about that from Jerry a little later on the agenda. All right. Uh, we don't have any special discussion or action items at this time, so we'll move into our committee reports. Um, and I will say that there does seem to be a lot of feedback. By the way, welcome Melissa Huggins from Spokane Arts. I noted you joined us as well. And so uh, we're going to move into our committee reports. But as you speak, folks, speak a little more slowly uh, so that there's space between your words because when there's a lot of feedback, it's hard to distinguish the words and hard to hear sometimes. So thank you for that. Mr. Rick Chase, Urban Forestry did not meet. But do you have anything to say, sir? Uh, the only thing I'd like to add is that Nick sent out the uh, bid for the Susie Stevens Trail I uh, didn't get any anything back, so we sent it out again in July. So we're hoping to get a bid back by August and still hope to start that Susie Stevens Trail by the fall. And that's all I have to add for urban forestry. Yes, so thank you for bringing that up. Again, that was due to a very nice donation in memory of her daughter who was killed uh, in Portland, I believe. And so uh, we are hoping that we will get a bid on that project so that we can begin that phase of the trail that would connect the Arboretum to the Fish Lake Trail. So I would encourage folks out there, if you know any construction companies, tell them to send in a bid. All right. So we will then move on to golf. Jerry. Good afternoon. And thank you. We at golf did meet this Tuesday, past Tuesday. And so we're bringing to uh, the board today an action item. Uh, we are continuing the upgrades and repair on our four city courses. 
So today what we're going to present to you by uh, Mark Poirier, our golf manager, will be giving you a detailed and some visual. Uh, we are looking at Indian Canyon. Uh, we are looking at the clubhouse and the adjacent pro shop regarding uh, repair to the roof. Um, when we have finished, uh, we'd like to allow some time for any questions from people on the board. So with that, uh, I would like to thank Mark ahead of time. Just, uh, he did a yeoman's job, uh, especially showing some pictures that we're going to have. So you'll have a first-hand view, especially from the overhead, if you will, a little topographical, and you'll have just a better idea of uh, what we're looking at as far as needs at this particular time. So with that, Mark? you please present your uh, information for our uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jerry. I'll attempt to share my screen here as well. Can everybody see that in view form? Okay. So what I have for you today is a recommendation for Indian Canyon Group replacement um, with the company Garland DBS Incorporated. Um, so here's a top aerial view of the site location. Uh, the building on the right in the red box is the restaurant and the building on the left side is, is the pro shop area. Now in terms of the age and history of these roofs, the pro shop is original Cedar Shake. That was installed in 1984. Actually, that whole building was built in 1984 um, due to the USAM Publings Championship. So it's it's 37 years old, and, and the lifespan for a, a cedar shake roof is around 18 to 25 years, uh, maybe even a little less than that here in the Northwest. So um, that that roof is is well past its lifespan, and the restaurant roof is is made up of a, a vinyl shake, kind of a faux. Um, uh, sort of cedar shake look to it, and the installation date on that um, on that roof is unknown, but projected to be between 25 and 30 years old. And the lifespan for for a vinyl shake um, in that time era is about 20 years. So that roof is also well past its lifespan. As we get into some photos here, this is uh, the north facing side of the pro shop roof. Um, moving along, more pictures of the north side, as you can see. Um, very aged. And uh, here's the south side, kind of a more of an up close view there. As you can see, uh, shingles are, many shingles are missing, um, and deteriorated, uh, so on and so forth. Um, here we have a picture of the south facing um, club, the restaurant side rather, this is that vinyl shank that I was talking to you guys about. And as you can see, we're missing shingles. As you can also um, view on the screen here, the, the shingles are actually cupping or bowing up. That's a, that's a sign of, of um, need and replacement as well. Um, another view from the top uh, north side now of that restaurant area, missing a ton of shingles. And, and really the, the contractors um, were even skeptical of, on even getting on the roof as to cause uh, more damage than we already have. Um, Here's another picture depicting uh, of the condition of the roof. And here's the last one here with uh, many shingles missing and um, in poor condition. Now the scope of work is gonna consist of uh, removing the existing shingles uh, from the substrate, uh, inspect substrate to make repairs as necessary, um, applying uh, a sheeting over the top of the substrate, um, new overlayment, uh, 30 year architectural shingle, um, will be applied for manufacturer's recommended um, instructions and details. Um, removal and replacement of rotten and damaged fascia boards, and then a uh, 24 gauge metal break shape fascia over the wood fascia boards. And this will also provide the city with a standard third year warranty on this, on this roof. And here's an example of what the roof could potentially look like. Um, this is an example of, of a brand new um, uh, uh, shingle roof there. Um, and in terms of procurement solution, um, I'm, I'm recommending that we, we go with uh, a state contractor, um, much like we did with the uh, 
with the equipment purchase that we that we did uh, for all the the mowers uh, for the golf course, this ensures us um, some of the best pricing that we can get. Um, this company has has industry leading buying power and, and world class suppliers, um, and also provides a, a very fast turnaround with a, with the completion date of October 31st of this year. And uh, this company also has has had prior golf course property experience where they have re-roofed um, two of the county courses, one at Hangman and one at Liberty Lake. So they kind of know the the, uh, the song and dance of working around a, a busy golf course. So that's really a plus as well. Um, on, on this page here, uh, I know it might be a little bit hard to see on the screen here, but this is just a, a letter from the Garland Company and Drew Wright, the territory manager, just explaining, um, as you see the next slide in the cost, you know, why the cost have, have um, come up a bit from the anticipated uh, number. And a lot of it has to do with that, that plywood, that sheeting is, is up 300% from 2020. Um, and this is also, I might add, a, um, you know, the contractors don't know what to expect once they take off the existing roofing. We might be okay with that under sheathing and they may not be able to, you know, may not uh, require a replacement of it. So um, as of right now, uh, on the total increase there uh, between, you know, 12.6 and 14.7 um, for that sheathing on the pro shop side and, and 45 to $52,000 for the clubhouse side. So we have actually a potential deductive change order of around $67,000 if we do not need to replace that sheathing. Also, cost of shingles have, have skyrocketed. Skyrocketed underlayment and metal have gone up in price roughly 15% from 2020. Um, and then also the access to the building itself and the demo and install um, where that clubhouse is located. It's very difficult for a big dump truck to get close to that that building, so um, more manual labor is anticipated with this project, also increasing the cost. So here we get to Garland's uh, bid uh, for the clubhouse and, and restaurant side um, of $189,175 plus tax, and for the pro shop side, $79,353 and plus tax for an all-in cost of, um, you know, roughly $200. Seventy thousand dollars there um, plus tax for for both um, both buildings. So at this time, I'd just like to open up for any questions. Thank you, Mark. Really well done. Um, I'd have to say, I think all of us who are homeowners know that if you don't replace a roof when it needs replacing, you end up having more expensive repairs down the road from water damage and other issues. So this is money well spent in my view. If there's no more anybody questions. Else? Yeah, anybody else out there? I know a lot of you are not golfers uh, and maybe have not been to Indian Canyon, but uh, one of the other pluses at this particular time and Mark can kind of chime in with this, we currently do not have any leaks that are coming into the actual building. So I think that's something we are, we are keeping our fingers crossed about, Jennifer, as you said, it's an older building, but right now uh, we are catching things before fall or winter. And uh, that's something that as a golf committee and uh, chair representing and presenting this to the board, um, our, our timing is perfect. So, Great. So go ahead and make the motion, Jerry. Thank you. I'd love to. With that, uh, I would like to move uh, that the board approves the Indian Canyon roof replacement by Garland uh, CBS Incorporated not to exceed $268,528 plus tax. I would second that. And Barb seconded, Barb great. seconded great. All those in favor, everybody? everybody. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Great. Aye. Thank you, Jerry. What else happened at golf? Appreciate it. Well, I just, uh, a couple things, because as you heard from finances, golf is doing its thing, 
uh, and providing, I think, the outlets for all the community and outreach community beyond. Uh, but I would like to say that I know some of us in certain zip codes experience some outages, uh, complements of a VISTA with <laughs> some of our power, and it also affected a couple of our golf courses. But we were lucky uh, in some respects because we had booked things ahead of time, so we managed to get through. But it did affect us. Uh, but because of the dedication and organization that we have in place, uh, just kudos, I think, to the pros, the superintendents, and I keep hearing uh, just the accolades for how great the courses are looking at this time. So um, another special thanks again always to Park Ops, who helped us in golf get through the storm, get through the damage. Um, you know, we did deal with a variety of things, but it was a team effort. And then uh, I don't always get to thank everybody that uh, supports golf. You know, we have people like Jason and Nick Hammond and uh, Fiona and, you know, I could just go on and on. And we even had guests from um, finance, Mark Gooding and Megan. And uh, it's just nice to have everybody supporting and uh, working with golf as we move through the rest of the year. So with that, I thank you. And our next meeting will be August 10th at 8.05 a.m. Supposedly, we will be greeting you again on the square here in WebEx. So, anyway, thanks, Jennifer, and everybody. Thank you, Jerry. Gracious as always. And, yes, thanks to all the golf folks that's been a shining star throughout these times. So, Land Committee, Greta. Uh, yes, uh, Land Committee met on June 30th, and we had one action item that we wanted to bring to the full board because it's really cool. Um, and that would be the Franklin Park basketball court mural and donation, the Spokane Tribe and Spokane Indians Baseball Club. And I think we have Melissa and maybe two other folks here today to do a presentation um, on the uh, neat basketball court mural that we're gonna get in Franklin Park. Yeah, thank you, Greta. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, Great. Uh, well, thank you. I will kick things off and then I will turn it over to Otto Klein and Monica Tanaskis. Um, I'll just highlight a couple of things that you saw in your briefing packet that are updates from what the Lands Committee received. So you have an updated rendering of the court mural, which has some slight adjustments for the better that we're very pleased with. And then the other adjustment within the packet was uh, the request to include an interpretive sign on site, um, which would be a wonderful opportunity to expand and educate and provide some additional context um, information about the Spokane side, uh, explain you know, the cultural significance of the images that are found on the mural. So I just wanted to highlight those two quick updates and I will, uh, Turn it over to Otto and Monica as the initiators of this project um, for them to provide any other context and to help field questions. I'm hoping that we are going to get a picture. We are still seeing a black screen. There we Well, now I'm seeing the grid, everyone. <laughs> and there's Greta. Hello, Greta. So we are just having a picture of you. You want to sit in your pen? Oh, there it is. There we go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Otto Klein. Um, I serve as the Senior Vice President with the Spokane Indians, and a uh, pleasure to see all of you today. I think we have a great opportunity in front of us. Um, we are asking for your support and approval of the uh, artwork that has passed several different committees. Uh, we've been working in partnership uh, with our friends with the Spokane Tribe of Indians on this project, and it is to install um, a new mural at Franklin Park, and we are celebrating Native American imagery and the different imagery that has been developed through the years um, with the Spokane Indians baseball team and our historic partnership that we've been developed, uh, that we've developed through over time. And I think that this is a really good opportunity for us to um, celebrate the, the first peoples of this area and to do it in a fun way. And this is with the um, 
the Hoop Fest and the Hoop Town initiative to install uh, beautiful artwork on the basketball courts that are renovated. Uh, we have uh, come up with this artwork that you see before you, and it really it signifies a lot of different things that um, have historical significance to the tribe and, and that we want to help share with you. And that is first the river, the Spokane River, um, the canoe. Uh, we're talking about the red band trout that you see that we have uh, changed one of the city parks with that initiative. Um, celebrating Spokane signature fish. Uh, the biggest one is probably language. And if you see the language that is written on the, the court here, you know that that is uh, featured on the front of our Spokane Indians baseball uniforms, which are um, in the Baseball Hall of Fame. We have a drum and music. You know, we're trying to, and we also have the camas plant and the camas flower that is featured here, which also has a lot of uh, cultural significance. So I think we've done a, a, a nice job or, uh, with this project. It is fully funded uh, between the tribe um, with the majority of the funds being allocated and then also the Spokane Indians and our Red Band Rally campaign. So it is a fully funded project and our goal is to start in the next uh, three to four weeks with this project. We hope to be completed uh, by mid-August, um, if we could, with our friends at, at Hooptown, and then really have a, a ceremony and a blessing of the court uh, with the tribe and with the team and, um, you know, have food trucks and, and music and honor song and all the different things that we can dream up together and make it a special um, addition to our community. Um, so, this is what I bring before you and um, happy to answer any questions, but also want to um, leave the floor for Monica um, if she'd like to say a couple words. Um, I just want to say how uh, thank you, Ryan, of uh, the work and the partnership that the Spokane Indian baseball team and the tribe have had, and it's been a longstanding uh, positive relationship, and they've just done an excellent job of um, betraying the tribe and using our language in a respectful manner. And so this project is, um, well, I guess uh, the simplest word is awesome <laughs> for uh, to be able to have this in the middle of Spokane is a great representation of the Spokane tribe and, and the land and, and the city. So it's, it's a great representation of the partnership that we have. Hi, Thanks. this is Anna Kick. I just have a quick question. Could you repeat the name of the flower that's in the uh, the image and just talk about what the cultural significance is? That is a camas flower, and uh, it is a traditional food. Um, we we now go dig it. Every year we have an actual um, gathering where we meet some of the other tribes and we, we go dig the cabbage root. So it is used as a traditional food and it's been a traditional food for, for uh, several years. I probably since the you know, beginning of time that flower, that root has been used. It's beautiful, and I love this design. Thank you so much for your part in this and the work that you guys have done. I think this is really going to benefit the city in a lot of ways. I also enjoyed doing a bit of a rabbit hole deep dive into canoe design. I was not familiar with the sturgeon nose design of this canoe. I had to learn the terminology. Um, but it was really interesting to read about and to read about um, how that was significant in some of the articles that I found. So. It's uh, been a fun, fun thing to explore, and I think it does encourage people to do that. The design encourages people to, to find out more, and that's exactly what we want. So it's a great design. I love it. Well, Thank great. You. I'm glad we um, decided not to put this on the consent agenda so that we could all uh, learn more about it at the meeting today. And I understand that the cost of the mural is covered by Spokane Tribe and Spokane Indians with support from Spokane Arts and Hoop Town USA. But I would like to go ahead and move that we approve the Franklin Park 
basketball court mural and donation by the Spokane Tribe and Spokane Indian Baseball Club. I'll second that. Um, moved and seconded. Is there, is there uh, further discussion? Thank you for the generous gift. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. And Greta, if I could just add real quickly, this is Garrett. Um, I just want to thank Monica and Otto. You know, our partnership with the Spokane Indians baseball team continues to grow in numerous ways, and it really started with uh, the renaming of uh, Red Band Park. Our partnership with the community fireworks, um, the initiatives and support that we're doing on, on creating access to the Spokane River, and believe it or not, too, they're going to help us partner in a way to to be able to advocate our park and open space master plan as well um, at the baseball club. So, again, Otto, thank you so much uh, for your support to uh, the Spokane Parks and Recreation, and thank you, Monica, for your support. And looking forward to continue to grow the partnership. Yes, thank you very much. Um, any more discussion? All right, I if I'll call for the question. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Raise your hand. Yeah. Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right, uh, carries unanimously. Thanks again. Very good. So. Greta, you had some interesting topics of discussion during land. We we did. We talked about a couple other things. We uh, Nathan Wynn presented an update on the downtown Spokane uh, plan. A couple items of interest to parks is the Bosch lot that I think is now called the Lincoln lot. Um, it's considered an, an opportunity zone in the downtown. Um, it's the only park-owned property identified uh, as such in the downtown Spokane plan. And also there, there I, I believe maybe there should be some change in height restrictions on buildings that may uh, affect shadowing on uh, Riverfront Park. We, um, oh, also the point was made that the, um, the downtown plan recommends that the city work in consultation with the Spokane Tribe of Indians to develop a master plan for the Bosch lot um, site that honors its significance to the tribe. That's great. Yeah. Um, I was trying to remember, and I think Melissa is correcting me here in the chat, but um, didn't May Jean design an art plan as a part of her contract with us for Stepwell that went beyond the bounds of the riverfront, that looked at where the downtown art was, maybe in terms of an art walk. That's something I remember. Am I not remembering that correctly? The master art plan was primarily for the park, but it did take into account, you're remembering correctly, it does take into account um, there's so much public art that is near the park, but not technically within the borders of riverfront. So along the Centennial Trail, along the convention center. And so the master plan noted those and took those into account, um, okay. but that was as far as it went. It was primarily Riverfront Park. Okay, so the reason I bring that up is that I noted, and this is for Council Member Cathcart, just maybe take back to City Council. I noted that uh, as a part of the downtown plan in the notes, they were talking about creating a master art plan for the city. And so I thought, well, why reinvent the wheel? Let's start with what we already have with Riverfront Park is the nexus and Mei Jean Yoon's wonderful work. After all, she is the art and architecture chair of MIT. I mean, what better professional can you get? So at least that could perhaps be the, the kernel of the start of that downtown art plan, not reinvent the wheel. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that in the city charter, the Arts Commission is sort of tasked with leading the municipal art plan. But we have talked with Nick Ahmad um, about, you know, making sure that we coordinate that arts master plan with parks and with all the other relevant stakeholders. So you're right. We will absolutely take that into account. Great. Land was really interesting this month. I'm sorry I wasn't there in person. All right. Great. Thank you, Greta. Anything else? Well, from land, we also discussed um, an updating the park tobacco free policy to include uh, vaping devices. Um, so that's something that may be coming, 
coming to us and probably will be coming to us uh, sometime in the future. Nick Hammett provided an update of the park and open space master plan. I, I think we're going, going full uh, bore right now, gathering public input. So if any of you is approached for a survey, please park it. <laughs> and Carl discussed the parks report and went over the uh, process of reopening bathrooms and, and noted that there's been some difficulty hiring staff um, this year. So everybody have a little bit of patience if, if the bathroom's not 100% Stocked, or uh, there would be leads going somewhere because we're doing the best we can. And that was the summary of our discussion at LAMP. And the next meeting is 3.30 p.m. on August 4th, uh, still via WebEx. That's my report. Thank you, Greta. Thank you very much. And I heard Sally clearing her throat, getting ready for rec. So right into Recreation Committee. Uh, having a sneezing attack. <laughs> Okay, so REC didn't meet, but I do have a couple of um, shout outs uh, that I'd like to make sure everybody's aware of. And one is that um, Pool World generously donated um, two free swim days in August, um, August 6th and August 13th. So that was really appreciative and um, we we'll just want to make sure everybody's aware and thank Pool World for their generous gift. And then secondly, our kayak rentals is off to a really great start. Last weekend it opened, and of the 12 kayaks that are available to rent both Saturday and Sunday, they were both filled. Um, and same with this coming weekend, they are both booked up uh, Saturday and Sunday. Um, so, you know, really exciting to see such a great interest. And if there is um, any group, um, groups that want to rent kayaks, I'm sorry, Jennifer, I don't have the phone number in front of me, but um, there is a number to call. Do you want me to read that off or do you want to read that off um, for people to have? They want to do a group reservation. I'll put it in the, I'll put it in the chat box, but okay. it's, all, it's the 311. Um, oh, okay. I thought it was a 710 number, and um, but if you can call 3112, that's perfect. Anyway, I just um, kudos to Jennifer and her team for all this great work. It's, uh, it's really exciting to see everything come uh, full circle in our uh, pools and all of our programs. And our next um, um, rec meeting will be August 4th, virtual 515. Thank you, Sally, and thank you, Jennifer Papage, for all your good work. So, in addition to your staff. All right. We're going to move on then to Riverfront Park. Nick had a very interesting meeting. Yeah, we had some good stuff happen, and we got together before the 4th of July, so we were able to have a really good meeting before everybody took off for the holiday. So, uh, we do have some action items, and for the first one, I will turn it over to Barry. Well, I'm going to have to act as Barry today, so I apologize with no illustrations, videos. Um, but what I would like to just give you a, an overview of what we're acting on today. If you remember going through executive team RFP committee, we have a great partnership with Sheldon Jackson, Jackson in the Papillon building with Selkirk Development, uh, just north of, of the butterfly on the North Bank Promenade. And a part of that agreement that was passed by the park board is to review the final landscape design. And if you remember, it incorporates their property and our property around that butterfly to have this seamless design as it really seems to be, you know, that, be that one campus type of look, similar to what we worked on with the public facilities district in the sportsplex complex. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over. You haven't heard his voice in a while, but Mr. Guy Michelson, uh, that's been working with Sheldon Jackson on, on that landscape design. Um, to go through that presentation. He is via phone. So, Guy, if you can, once we get the presentation up, just to say the next slide and Pamela can get to that. And right now, Pamela, we're still just seeing a black screen. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. Perfect. That's great. Still seeing a black screen. Well, I will, well, Pamela tease that up and I appreciate it because I'm having some IT issues. Um, 
A, good to see some familiar faces and names and some new names. So thrilled to be in front of Park Sport again um, and also thrilled to continue to, to be able to be part of, um, of Riverfront Park. And so um, you, had, you had seen before, and it's going to be a slide here. I know Pamela's pulling it up, uh, what we had proposed before. Um, and there was nothing wrong with that. We were thrilled to have it approved. Um, but as we looked at it more, it was based on some hard geometries that were extending the promenade into the site. Um, and as we looked at it more, it, it, and when I say the site, uh, right up to the Papillon project. Um, but as the North Bank started to wrap up and we looked at the, the then complete um, hill climb up to the podium, there was just a lot of very linear kind of competing geometries. And Sheldon kind of had us revisit how can we make this feel like more like a park and less hardscape. And then um, are you still working to pull that up, Pamela, it looks like? She is. I see the cursor moving. She's trying hard. Sometimes I do too. Cool. Well, I, I super appreciate it. So, I, so um, and, it, and it, it's also um, was in your updated park, park packet from yesterday. But anyways, um, one of the things that we ended up doing was going back to what we've always said was a key part of um, the proposed design was that the North Bank would to some way mirror the South Bank. And so one of the things we did is instead of trying to bring in a lot of hard geometry, we looked at the landscape around the loop and the gondola and the visitor center, uh, and we brought a lot of that material back to the North Bank um, so that it really does, the North Bank does mirror the South Bank. And so we don't have as much competing geometries, but instead we're bringing back the same pavers that are used in the South Bank in the same way. Uh, we're bringing in curved forms, just like you see in the basalt walls. We're bringing in the same materials in that we're using um, what we call the, the battered basalt, which is along the boardwalk in front of the loop. We're using that as well in the North Bank in front of Papillon. And um, also bringing in what we call our basalt talus, which is how we deal with the steep slopes in the central green as part of the pavilion project. And then finally, the previous proposal you had seen included wayfinding signage that um, was more branded based on the Papillon project. And one of the things we've done is we're just bringing the riverfront signage right in. It is part of riverfront, so we're using riverfront signage. We're using the riverfront colors, that bold color palette. And we are using, uh, we, have, we have a new addition though to the, to the, to the riverfront, um, what we always call big steel family, which is a nice lean rail and counter, all public, um, that just is a great place for people to perch uh, and look out south across the promenade and, and to the north bank and across the north bank. So basically it's, the proposal is just bringing that language around loose and, um, and the gondola to the north bank instead of the more rigid linear geometry you had before. And I really appreciate Pamela trying to do this because uh, this was sort of sprung on her, and I apologize. We saw it in our packet. Just, yeah, and then it just followed up with a, a number of, of renderings. And the other thing I would point out, I, I maybe missed the most important part, which is, and eh, not the most important part, but an important part, um, is as you're looking down the street at the beautiful um, yellow riverfront sign, we wanted to have beautiful lawn behind that, that kind of popped the sign, and that welcomes people lounging just like we have in the grass around the loop. So really the predominant landscape is um, mowed lawn, super flexible, very useful. Um, there is limited planting. It's actually a butterfly planting palette that we're doing in some key areas. Three beautiful ginkgo trees to provide a little bit of shade um, around the butterfly. So it's a very simple design that mimics the form and detail of the um, South Bank. Hey, there oh. it is. And, and now I've talked through it. So I'm gonna, I think we can move through it pretty, pretty quickly. Thank you, Nick, for doing that. Um, so there's what, the, what you see on your screen now was the previous plan. And you can keep scrolling, Nick, and I'll, I will move through there. 
there's your reminder. Hopefully you all recognize this as part of your park. <laughs> and all of those materials kind of find a new home in this simple, um, we think pretty elegant design. Um, and again, one of the things I'm really excited about, you can see the three ginkgo trees there, but we're bringing those eight inch square pavers with the pixelated pattern um, right up to Papillon. We have some steps, there's a surprising amount of gray transition. I should also note, we wanna make sure this terrace is ADA accessible. So we're actually using the podium hill climb to make it ADA accessible and tying in. We think that's tying everything together really strongly. And again, otherwise it is a simple lawn. There are two berms to complement what we call the Mima mounds, the Mima mounds that are part of the, the North Bank playground. We choose, there's two berms in here, it's a little hard to see. But as we go through, you'll see some, some uh, elevation, some, some, uh, some views. There's a view of what that looks like. Um, you can just scroll through. There's that idea of having grass behind the sign, lots of place for people to lounge. Um, gosh, I think we're showing our story beautifully here. <laughs> I, I, you know I can talk to fill time, but I don't know that I need to. Oh, I want to point out, there's our super exciting addition to the Riverfront family um, with the lean bar and eating bar for people to just to lean up against. But I want to stress, that's, that's a public amenity. There's no commerce or anything. Like we dream that this is a place that's charged with activity and people spill out from the adjacent buildings, but that's this public amenity. And you can imagine, I think, going out there with your latte and uh, getting a great view all the way down the Howard Street promenade. I think that that is the entire presentation um, that we need to hit. And we would just ask for your approval of the revised design and hope you like it. So, Guy, I have to tell you that one of the things I appreciate about this, and uh, Sheldon, you too, uh, is the seamlessness of this design, this landscape design, with what's already going on in that area. And even the lean bar, um, yeah, the, the leaning bar, to me, that echoes the, the way that the Howard Street Bridge looks. And so you guys have really tied it beautifully into the park. I just really appreciate that attention to detail. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate, we appreciate that you appreciate it. Yeah, Barry was very excited about the bar. So, uh, any other comments, questions? I would just say to Nick, this, this checks another box off the master plan that was approved in 2014 of these type of private public partnerships. Um, so kudos for everyone involved because it's another success story for the North Bank. Definitely. All right, then I will make a motion to accept the design changes for the Papillon South landscape improvements to the Selkirk development as presented in the documents. I'll second. All right, any further question or comment? No, Not, I'll call for the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guy. Appreciate it. Thank you for oh. giving us the time. And uh, man, you guys, you got to know we're so insanely proud of Riverfront. Every I'm going to be there next week. You're going to see me wandering aimlessly through the park all week long, basking in its glow. It is a treasure. Okay. And it is. And yeah, it's for and sure. a huge team effort. Thanks for being part of the team. All right, All thank right. you so much. All right, we have another action item. Uh, Nick is going to present about a dog park. Yes, this uh, I am not able to wax poetic quite as well as Guy Michelson, but I will give you the best I got. So you should be seeing a screen here. Oh, let's see. You probably don't want to see the letter of intent. Give it a second, and we'll get there. Try again here. You should be seeing a PowerPoint on your screen here. All right. So the Riverfront Park North Bank Dog Park is something that we, at least uh, Leroy, had been talking with some private developer for a number of years 
at very early on through the riverfront park process, and it was never something that worked its way into uh, that sort of tier one set of improvements. Um, and it's conveniently, conveniently come back around as a public-private partnership here, uh, which could be really advantageous for that portion of the park. So um, give you a little background here. Uh, the North Suspension Bridge, of course, which we're in construction on right now, is uh, just to the south of the site, which is in, a, in red. This would be a, at Broadway, and I believe it's Mallon, but I always get confused between Mallon and Post. Uh, just next to the Wonder Building and the Upper Falls Condos. Uh, this is actually a great little entry into Riverfront Park from the west and from the north. Um, and you see with the blue line here, the uh, boundary around the future site of the Falls Towers. And this is a private residential or mixed use development adjacent to the dog park. See so here, this is uh, the approximate area for the proposal of the what they're calling the North Bank Dog Park Facility. Um, inside this area now is the existing Boy Scout shelter. This is one of the historic octagon um, shelters from Expo 74. Um, it was not in this location during Expo, was moved here shortly after. During Expo, this was the site of the Boy Scout camping uh, location. And so this is termed the Boy Scout shelter. It is a historic structure. And of course, the existing suspension bridge and pathway. Let's see a Google Street View here see the shelter in the background, you see some lawn area, um, some park area there, um, the entry to the Upper Falls condos, and then down to um, the North Suspension Bridge to your left, and then a nice construction fence next to our, the property for the Falls condos. This is a view looking up from the suspension bridge, pretty heavy vegetation in this area. You know, it's, it's a well-loved, well-lived life. Um, could use some landscape upgrades, some opening of the views, of course, from up above down to the water. So overall landscape renovation is really wanted, wanted and needed in this area. There's some visible rot and of course some deterioration in our uh, pavilion structure, which has been there for a number of years, about 50 years, just under that. You see that relationship yet again there. And then, so why do this? I mean, next to us, we have a, a potential partner here who is uh, investing a significant sum of money in constructing a new condo building and uh, amenity, a set of amenities along the riverfront here. Uh, one of the things they'd like to do is construct a river walk all the way along the shoreline adjacent to Riverfront Park. Just enhance that uh, community view, that public access to our Spokane River. As a part of their work, they have proposed to us a concept for a dog park in Riverfront Park, roughly in that area above the, the bridge tower. Uh, this rendering, I think, is illustrative in showing you where that location would be, not exactly what those improvements would look like, but they might include you know, some public access along the waterfront, a fenced area with uh, open air fencing in and out of a, a dog park area that would serve their condo owners, of course, uh, the adjacent condo owners here at Deborah Falls Condo, the Rover at the Wonder Building, and any from, anyone from the public who might want to use it. So this would be uh, proposed to be fully open to the public. Again, another graphic here showing the area that would be comprised uh, for the dog park. So the details of the letter of intent, uh, we don't have any wonderful renderings like what Guy has shared, uh, but we do have some details for you and hope, in hopes to get to that set of wonderful renderings. Uh, really, this would be renovating this space into a public amenity by restoring our historic shelter, uh, preserving, of course, the historic walls, the bridge tower, uh, got to have that, uh, renovating our landscape areas, you know, adding fencing lighting, adding walkways, enhancing that connection to the street, and just sort of overall um, sprucing up of this area. What's key here is that uh, we've got language in the agreement that would require the design to be mutually acceptable to both the falls and to the parks department. Um, as a part of that service, the falls would really do the heavy lift. They would provide the design of this space, the permit um, and detailed development services. They would ensure that the design would comply with all of the authorities having jurisdiction for permits. Of course, they would fund the improvements at no cost to the city. They would also fund the design of the improvements at no cost to the city, and they would deed a portion of their land to the city 
that would be w underneath this dog park for permanent uh, public use. Uh, they would also donate all the physical improvements upon completion to the city, and they would maintain regular maintenance here for 20 years. Now, any major repairs, any really significant uh, repairs might be on us here in this case, but I think the day-to-day -day maintenance routine uh, maintenance here would be proposed for 20 years, and I think John Moga sounds like he likes that. So they would also propose to open and close the gates in and out of this space uh, during that time. So what would we provide here? Um, we would really be providing the land, uh, allowing that development to effectively uh, construct a little bit more of an amenity on public property just adjacent to the private development. Um, they are all asking also for naming rights to the dog park uh, for the duration of the 20-year agreement. Um, they, they would also ask for the Parks Department to fund any utility expenses, water, sewer, power, et cetera. And uh, they would ask us to enforce the park rules just like we would anywhere else within Riverfront Park. And we have actually requested to convene a design steering committee with stakeholders uh, to ensure we get adequate public input here. So this would be other condo owners, the Wonder Building, dog park stakeholders, park board stakeholders, uh, a number of folks to make sure that it's not really just the developer that's driving all of this and, and that we get that well-rounded uh, public opinion of, of what's going to be the best benefit here. Um, assuming the LOI uh, is passed today, we would work over the course of the summer to uh, draft up uh, the formal project agreement in whatever form it wants to live. Uh, we would then work through the fall and winter on design, hope to get out in permit, uh, and get out into construction in spring or summer of 2022, but really try and open this amenity to the public at the end of next year. Um, it would be a pretty cool story to have our suspension bridge opening for the spring of next year and then have this follow right thereafter uh, to be able to provide that additional amenity. So that's what I've got for you. Any questions or comments? As I said in the chat, I'm just so very appreciative of the public mindedness of this donation, really and this uh, process, the fact that the public input is wanted and asked for, um, it's just such an asset to the park. Dog parks are very much in demand right now, and so um, the Falls LLC is to be thanked for this community-mindedness. Yeah, and if I could add, Jennifer, I mean, the, you know, the one individual behind this, of course, is Larry Stone. I got to tell you, he's one of the biggest cheerleaders that we have for Riverfront Park. Um, this proposal came to us. We did not seek it. Um, so it was great, you know, meeting with him in person and going through all of this. And um, again, is a common theme here. What a way to a great partner to have adjacent to Riverfront Park that really wants to invest back into our park system. And Jennifer, if I could, Garrett, um, just to tell what you're saying, I think that as we look at the potential conclusion for the campaign for Riverfront Park and participation in the partnership that we've had with the Park Foundation over the past, you know, well, 70 years really, but regard to the campaign over the last three. Um, I think this is just a beautiful opportunity to finish another one of those tier two, tier three projects, which is that Boy Scout shelter. And um, I had an opportunity to visit Nick earlier this week and was so impressed with the amount of thought that's gone into really what this could be, not only for, um, for the Falls constituents, but also just for our community at large. And I um, want to just publicly state the commitment and uh, the desire of the Spokane Park, uh, Park, Park Foundation to ensure that if there's something that we can do to assist in the facilitation of this gift, whether it be similar to an MOU like that we did with, um, with Hoop Cap USA, we're all in. So great job, Nick and team. Um, great job to the Fox Larry Stone. It's such a tremendous advocate. Um, for parks and recreation in this community. It's just a beautiful thing. So thank you. Hey, a quick quick question on this. I'm just wondering, since it's a uh, public-private partnership, who, who's in charge of sort of the day-to-day -day just operation of it once it's up and running? Will, will it be parks that's in charge of that? So in the uh, LOI right now, Michael, we're proposing that the actual opening and closing of the space would be done by the Falls LLC. They'd actually do the routine maintenance as well, but that the security aspects of it would be uh, our responsibility as the city. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. I think it's also important to note that we have 
you know, with the due diligence of the park board, we have the naming and sponsorship policies already in place. We also have the park board where the, uh, you approve the, the tiered approach on the naming amounts to within Riverfront Park. So again, if, if and when we don't, you know, we don't know what or if the naming right would even look like, of course, then that would come back to the park board of whatever that recognition would be, if that is going to be a request uh, from the falls. Yes, that's my understanding as well. Any other question or comment? All right, I'd like to make a motion to accept the Riverfront Park North Bank Dog Park letter of intent with the Falls LLC. I'll second that. Uh, really, this would be renovating this space into a public amenity by respect. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, one more ask for questions or comments. Oh, we seem to be getting some radio feedback or something. Yeah, but. somebody's listening to us while they're on the call with us. So. All right, I will call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, our third and final action item is Hooptown USA Court's Memorandum of Understanding with Hoopfest, and that's going to be presented by John. Good afternoon, everyone. John Moak here, Director of Riverfront Park. I'm happy to share uh, the Memorandum of Understanding with you between uh, Riverfront Park and um, Spokane Hoopfest Association. So let me go ahead and get this queued up here. If you can't see the screen, please let me know. Um, so you might all be familiar with our lovely and wonderful new Hooptown USA courts up on the North Bank. Uh, they're beautiful. Uh, the picture on your screen here is an actual aerial footage of the completed artwork. It's amazing, and we're getting just a lot of positive feedback. So thank you to MultiCare for their gift uh, and partnership and built from Hoop, um, HoopFest itself. So um, I'm here today to kind of uh, talk about how this court will be used. Uh, Spokane Hoop Fest Association approached us and said, you know what, we want to play uh, Lee, have a Lee play up on the court. And uh, we want to also ensure the longevity of the courts for, um, for the future. And, and so we're right in agreement with that. We want to make sure the courts are maintained uh, for the future. And uh, we want to also um, make sure that there's a funding source to help maintain those courts, but we also want to help activate the park too. And so we think it's a win-win. The MOU uh, is a three-year agreement, uh, which both parties hope to renew within those three years. Uh, under this agreement, uh, Riverfront's responsibilities would be to reserve the court for hoop fest use, league play, uh, Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursdays um, between these dates, uh, April 15th to June 1st, and then July 15th to September 1st between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. Uh, so we would be putting the sign up there, notifying the public. We really worked with HoopFest to make sure that we find a good compromise between um, weekend time, or weekday times, evening times to make sure that the public still has access to the court. Uh, also, uh, we would provide the parking lot and courts for the actual Hoop Fest event. Uh, and in addition to that, we would provide an additional three days of reserve time for the court and parking lot. On those additional three days, uh, we've reached agreement that they would reserve the lot for a charge of $500 per day. Um, also, and then finally, uh, we would help store the league equipment, and then we would clean and maintain the courts. Um, as needed. Uh, under HoopFest responsibilities, uh, they would contribute $3,000 annually uh, into a city reserve fund uh, that would be used specifically to keep these courts maintained. We want to make sure that the mural is damaged, that we have funds to be able to do that, or if the concrete is damaged, we have the ability to do that, or the courts, uh, or the hoops, so uh, we can do, uh, we make those repairs. Uh, HooFest uh, will uh, maintain, repair, and replace uh, the Hall of Fame, which is still in development. It hasn't been installed yet, and as well as the current installed sound system at their expense. So this would not come out of the funds for the 3000 And then additionally, they would provide three, six, or six free public activations annually at Riverfront. Uh, 
Uh, so this was uh, something similar would be we just had a basketball fitness series in uh, the pavilion a couple months ago. And so we would have similar types of activities associated with basketball and fitness or uh, other related activities in the park that would be free to the public. So that helps uh, fulfill our mission as well as activating the park and providing um, low, free or low cost activities to the community. And that's really about it. It's a very simple agreement. Um, and so I'm happy to take any comments or questions and then I'm ask for your approval for the memorandum of understanding with Spokane Hoop Fest Association. I love this mural, so I'm going to put in a plug for a t-shirt. I know you have to go with the artist and Hoop Fest to uh, allow that, and Spokane Arts is an important facilitator as a part of this process, but I think it would make a great t-shirt. Jennifer, can I ask you a quick question? Um, yes. do, you, do you know, Jonathan, and, and I can always follow up with Matt on this, but do you know, will, will this league play have any connection to the like three-on-three -three nationals that that's been out there for the last decade or so, would there be a connection to that, do you know? I, I don't know, council member. I can ask for you that hasn't come up in our discussion. Okay, I, I think it'd be, it'd be amazing if, if that could be, you know, something that could be developed, but I'll, I'll follow up with Matt and chat with him about it. Sounds good. Any other question or comment? All right, I'd like to make a motion to accept the Hooptown USA Courts Memorandum of Understanding with Hoopfest, Spokane Hoopfest LLC, I guess that's what John called it. Uh, Spokane Hoopfest Association. Association, thank you. This is Barbell second. Awesome. Uh, final ask for question or comment. All for the vote, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, John. Appreciate the presentation. All right. So Aye. those were the action items. Um, it was a good meeting. We had a, a good conversation with Hal uh, McGlathery uh, concerning uh, a commemoration uh, for King Cole within the park or, or in the vicinity. Um, sounds like there's lots of good ideas out there and we had some good conversations about uh, some different options and opportunities. Um, ultimately, they're just starting to explore what we could possibly do and, and get some different people on board and, and there will definitely be more conversations and meetings to come on that. But um, I know that I think it's, I believe it's a great uh, opportunity to, to um, commemorate King Cole and, and uh, I hope that uh, we can find a way to do it uh, respectfully that, and in a way that, that really uh, lends to Riverfront Park and Spokane as a whole. Next, uh, uh, yes. before we, <clears throat> excuse me, before we leave, this is Jerry. Uh, I just wanted to offer a, just a huge thank you. And it's so exciting because when I started on the park board, this whole North Riverfront Park was just a thought. And in a very short time, it's pretty exciting to see where we are. Um, and I know it might be just kind of a thought in the background, but it's kind of like build it and they will come. And I think that's kind of where we are. So today with uh, Sheldon, your presentation, and then Nick sharing the dog park, and then now, John, looking at who's down, um, I mean, sometimes, you know, you just have to pinch yourself because look where we are right now. And I, I just um, can't even forecast where we're headed. But anyway, it's been a real privilege for me to serve on the Riverfront Park Committee. So I thank the board. And I think um, on top of that and, and, you know, with the pavilion activation and the concerts and all the things that are going on and, and how hard John and his staff are working to activate the park, um, Spokane is lucky. Um, I, like you, I'm very honored to have been part of, of this from uh, very early on in the design phase through right. now and, and just excited to see where we can go in the future. But um it, it is amazing. It's amazing, and, and it's it, I love it when you see online all, people talking positive about all the work and all that stuff. So, yeah, I, I definitely echo your comments, Jerry, for sure. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, we have nothing else. There's a, John did present his operations report. You can read that in the minutes from the meeting. Um, our next meeting is set for 4 p.m. on August 9th. You're muted, Jennifer. Sorry, thank you. I wanted to put into the public record because it was in the chat that the kayak rentals that Jennifer Papage said she was going to find for us, the number, you can call 311 or 755 2489. All right. So now we will move to Rob Anderson and Finance Committee. Thank you, Jennifer. The Finance Committee met Tuesday, July 6th at 3 p.m. Finance had one action item for Parks Fleet Replacement Pilot Program that was approved and recommended to the board as part of our consent agenda. The Fleet Replacement Program started in 2019 with five vehicles and has increased each year with a plan to have 30 vehicles in the fleet at the end of 2022. John Bowles presented a, a requested financial analysis of Skyride and the Booth Carousel. The attractions combined generate sufficient revenue to cover expenses, plus fund and improvement maintenance reserve. And thanks, John, for all that your efforts doing that. Mark Bunig presented the June financial recap reports and halfway through 2021, Park's fiscal position signifies solid management. Increases to salary cost expenses continue to be offset by revenue generation. Upcoming large events at Riverfront Park, like Pig Out in the Park, and the Pavilion at Riverfront Summer Concert Series will bring new dynamics to parks management. It will be interesting to see the balance between increased revenue and operating expenses. The next finance committee meeting scheduled for August 10th at 3 p.m. via WebEx or perhaps will be combined in person and WebEx. That's all for finance. Do you like to segue right into development and volunteers at that board? Certainly. The development and volunteer committee, known as the DVC, did not meet in June, but an introductory DVC meeting is scheduled for July 13th. And this meeting will serve as an introduction of volunteers to board members and park staff while setting an agenda for the full DVC meeting scheduled for August 2nd. So it will be exciting at the next board meeting that we can actually say the DVC met. That's all I've got. Thank you, Bob. So I have to echo what everybody's been saying about the pride of Riverfront Park. And I just wanna say thank you to my fellow park board members, all of the previous park board members who were part of the design um, and making Riverfront Park become a reality, and then the staff, which continues to find ways to activate it in extraordinary circumstances. What a thing to be a part of. When you compare our Riverfront Park, our downtown park, and the size of Spokane with something like Central Park in New York City, there's no comparison. Um, I think that such a small town as Spokane, by comparison to have a, a, um, a park like we do downtown, it, I think it takes the cake. I think it's the top. So in my unbiased opinion, well done, everybody. Um, and Spokane ought to be very proud. Um, I also wanted to thank, and this is going to steal a little bit of Garrett's thunder, so forgive me, Garrett, but I'll let you handle the details. I wanted to thank the staff in the recent heat crisis for serving the public with the cooling centers while managing and protecting the assets that we've spent so much money um, bringing back, you know, the carousel and its buildings. You, you did a real careful balancing act there between making sure that the cooling centers were open and sort of handling the unknowns of all of that, and yet 
maintaining and protecting our assets and providing a service. So thank you for that, as well as Governor in Inslee's sudden change of plan, deciding not to be down at Riverfront Park but holding his press conference at the pavilion. That required fast action on the part of Garrett Jones, John Moog, Amy Lindsay, and all of the staff down there at Riverfront to get that up and running. Nothing like having to turn on a dime. You all made us look good. Thank you very much for that service. So that's all I had to say in my president's report. I'm going to turn us over to our liaison reports now and Greta Gilman with Conservation Futures. Yes, I, I have nothing to report except that the, uh, the nomination, um, nominations are still open through midnight July 31st for um, nominations for land to potentially be purchased via Conservation Futures. Thank you. All right. And then Terry Fortner, are you still on the line? You're still here, I I'm hope. Here. Hi. Good. So I would like to ask you to report. Uh, Barbara, she has asked me to ask you because uh, she wasn't present, I guess, at the last meeting. So she could right. report to our foundation. Well, as we know, our fabulous uh, Spokane Park Board liaison to the Spokane Parks Foundation is an incredibly busy um, person and um, occasionally has a conflict. Um, I do have to say we were so thrilled that she did provide a very detailed written report to the board and everyone just really appreciates her contributions and um, feels so strongly about the partnership between the foundation and the park. So we enjoyed a very wonderful, robust conversation with Patrick Stryker, the executive director of uh, COP. Um, we specifically talked about the grant, pro the programs that we provided grant funding for this year which would be the Cobb Santa Patrol and then the Off-Road Patrol. So he shared a slideshow presentation with lots of photos and um, lots and lots of stories. And I do hope that there's an opportunity for Patrick to share that information with all of you at some point, um, because I think that what they're doing and working collaboratively within our parks and um, specifically within the city, but also just countywide is really quite remarkable. And again, it's just a tremendous offer um, <clears throat> opportunity for the Spokane Parks Foundation to fund and to provide much needed funds. That really good work continues. And, and again, it just, you know, it helps um, keep our parks safe and helps people, you know, feel safe when recreating. And it just creates another enormous win um, for all of us, I think, in our community. Um, we received a, a very, very wonderful bequest um, from a longtime foundation board member and donor. Subsequently did have an opportunity to host his amazing uh, wife, his widow, um, at just an intimate dinner at our uh, immediate past chair's home. And I think that um, as we work with the family to identify how to really recognize those gifts in our community um, and really kind of kickstart our Hamblin Society, which many of you maybe or may not be aware of, that's our planned giving legacy society. And we have a handful of members and we've really been struggling to, um, we had a whole plan on how to kick that off last year. And then as we're all aware, 2020 kind of blindsided everybody. And so we're really working hard right now to, to get our sea legs and to bring that out into the community. Um, we are continuing to work on videos for our hybrid event. Um, actually, John Moog and his team are absolutely fabulous and we are working very, very feverishly at this point. We're gonna meet next week to see if there's an opportunity to actually have a hybrid event where we have all of our videos in the can and we're conducting a virtual event for those who maybe are not comfortable coming and being in a large public group. But perhaps there's a way for us to utilize that beautiful pavilion space and really provide a great VIP experience. We are looking at this as an opportunity to not only feature and thank the foundation donors and VIPs, but also an opportunity for us to welcome the city of Spokane and some of our county partners, VIPs into the mix so that we have an opportunity again, I think to demonstrate to the community, the collaborative nature of our relationships. And again, thank all of our donors and we all win, regardless of whether it's a donation to the Spokane Parks Foundation, uh, public-private partnership, something that's occurring within the county. It doesn't really matter. We're all winning. It just creates beautiful public spaces for all of us to enjoy. 
Um, <coughs> pardon me. The county reported that they are just seeing the same increases in golf uh, and really appreciative of the partnership with the city staff when they have questions and maybe have hurdles to overcome. Everyone's been very welcoming and uh, answered questions and really helped facilitate. And then when we look at aquatics, I cannot tell you what a thrill it is to be able to provide. We are up well over $45,000 this year in funding for scholarships and for lifeguard certification. More money coming in every day. Our goal is to not only fill the need this year to ensure that all 12 aquatic facilities <laughs> Excuse me. I don't know about anybody else, but this is the worst allergy season of my life. Please forgive me. We want to ensure that all 12 aquatic facilities countywide have the staff that they need to operate safely and efficiently. And we do understand that that could require us to provide additional funding throughout the year in the form of perhaps um, lifeguard certifications throughout the winter months um, in partnership with some of our local natatoriums. So we're continuing to work feverishly on that through the, the activities of the Drowning Prevention Coalition. And again, many, many thanks to Josh Oaks and Sarah Fitzgerald at the county. They have helped us understand the need and they've helped us um, refine and articulate our, our statements out into the community and to potential funders. And again, it's just a huge win for everybody to be able to demonstrate this kind of collaboration. And thank, Great, you. thank you. Yeah, have another drink of water. <laughs> it is, it's, it's fine. It's everybody's experiencing it. All right, so we will have Michael Cathcart say hello. Thank you yeah. for being here. Absolutely, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, I just say a couple things. Uh, one, double down on kudos to park staff and, and obviously running the, the cooling centers and and uh, providing that safe space for folks to go to get out of the heat. And also on just short notice, setting up the, the mayor's reopening event uh, that did feature the governor there at the pavilion. Um, just wonderful to see that. I know I saw Nick driving one of the golf carts around to help move people around down at the riverfront park. So that was great. Uh, the other thing I was just going to mention is uh, ARP dollars. Um, you know, just want to strongly encourage you guys to to kind of prioritize. I talked to Garrett a little bit about this yesterday, but just really prioritize what those ARP requests are going to be and, and get those submitted as soon as you can. Um, I think the first tranche of money is, is looking to be spent sometime around September 1st. Um, and it sounds like it's a little ways away, but, you know, time moves pretty quick. So be good to get all that organized. Uh, and I'll just share, I submitted a list of my requests yesterday uh, just to just our internal council uh, list. And in mine, I included some dollars for uh, kind of a phase one, you might call it, planning, developing um, at Minnehaha, where I think there's a, a great opportunity for a, a major park to be established, uh, a regional park. So that's a big priority of mine. Some additional dollars I put in there for just helping with some planning and design of other parks in Northeast Spokane as well as some additional dollars for uh, neighborhood and park lighting, which I think uh, for security is, is really beneficial, obviously. So just some of those are some of the requests I put in there, obviously really preliminary uh, council still has to deliberate, you know, all of these requests. And I'm sure you guys will have yours that you submit. Other departments will have some that they submit and we'll be filtering all those out to, to make our best, um, best uh, uh, opportunity, put our best opportunities forward. So, um, the other, other thing I would like to just bring up and just put a bug in everybody's ear, and I think Jennifer's had a conversation or two about this, and that's as we approach, quickly approach kind of the 50 year anniversary of Expo and uh, some of the work that went into to, to creating and establishing Expo, uh, just recognizing, you know, one individual in particular who helped to save the clock tower uh, and, and Keep that still still standing downtown I think would be a really good thing for us to, to think about how we might be able to recognize that person who, who is still alive today um, and uh, unfortunately wasn't able to save the, the depot but but did save the clock tower and so I think that'd be a, a really good thing and I looking back it, it, it's hard for me to figure out if it was either in 72 or 73 when it was actually torn down the the depot um, but we're we're quickly approaching 50 years there. So it'd be great to be able to put something together to, to honor and recognize that person. So 
just put that out there, ready to think about, and happy to have some future conversations on that uh, with the board and, and with Jennifer. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. In fact, we are having those internal conversations about when we do that. It's not a question of if, it's a question of only when. So um, yes, we will absolutely get on that. And we really appreciate your support of the mini ha ha idea is fabulous. So um, just bigger and better, that's wonderful. Um, Garrett, did we leave you anything to say? Gosh, I don't know, Jennifer. Um, no, yes, always. You know, again, a common theme of all these agreements, approval today, thank you, Park Board, on the great partnerships we have in the community. I think we just continue to grow and uh, create a stronger uh, partnership and value and ownership across the community. And just to highlight again, I, I mean, the record heat last week presented a lot of opportunities for us in parks and recreation. Um, first being one is just, um, you know, irrigation, uh, watering our, our, our assets, our, our street trees. Um, just know that, you know, park operations have done a great job working with urban forestry crew of assessing and doing what we call water routes of uh, assessing our urban forest and our park trees to see if there's any heat stress and actually hand water with a water truck trees in our parks. For example, we lost about four acres of irrigated space in Comstock Park. Uh, fortunately, with the council support, we're able to, we're under contract right now to repair that irrigation, uh, which once was manual. Now we're gonna be able to automate it. So that entire park will be automated moving forward. But right now, uh, we're out there hand watering um, once a week, all the trees and assets. The tree, uh, the, the grass is brown, grass will come back, we'll, we'll fix that, but the trees are really what we're focusing on. Um, also too, again, with the cooling centers, can't thank the staff enough working uh, with the mayor and our, our response, emergency response team. Uh, we had a tiered plan approach uh, with three different facilities within Parks and Recreation. Uh, to really hone in our resources and making sure that we're providing adequate services to the citizens. And again, this just shows parks and recreation can, not, not unless we can do it all, but we, we are the, the community center to be able to provide uh, those services for the community. Um, overall, we served uh, approximately 730 citizens uh, during that 10 day span. Um, didn't really see any hiccups along the way. We did have some emergency responses, but being downtown, they were able to respond in a very uh, quick manner and were able to uh, help those citizens out. The other two on top of the heat restrictions, we also, or with the heat, is we have water restrictions. So we're working with the water department. Chlorine is a big issue nationwide, especially here on the Western United States. And so we've been working with the water department on uh, watering windows, targeted watering, um, and, and every other day watering and, and really trying to limit the volume while keeping our parks green in this record heat, but also looking at the bigger picture with our water distribution system. And a part of that too, when we, we talk about chlorine, um, our staff has done a fabulous job. We, we hit the ground running. We, we provided open swim uh, this last week. Huge success. Um, we had a couple roadblocks along the way of finding chemicals, but we're able to pull through. We're able to provide that safe asset back to the citizens and also with the splash pads. These were facilities that were shut off for more than a year. And to be able to get those up and running um, as a free amenity back to the citizens at our neighborhood parks is a huge win. The other two is again with the governor's visit. I gotta tell you, so everybody said how great it was, but we actually did receive a handwritten note uh, today from the governor's office just thanking us and how professional, how great the venue was um, and the assets that we have there. So that's just a small glimpse of what we'll be able to do with our concert series. So really looking forward to that later this summer. Also, um, with the parks and natural lands, um, we're going to really hit with that master plan, the public phase starting next week. So we're gonna be uh, hitting our survey on the streets. You're gonna be seeing a pamphlet in your utility bills. We're gonna have pop-up events everywhere, uh, Vista um, or um, Spokane Indian baseball games at a Vista stadium, farmer's markets, you name it, we're gonna be there. Um, so uh, Nick Hammond and uh, Lauren have done a great job of coordinating that with our partners. And I'll also, also be at uh, City Council Monday night doing some plugs for the um, public participation as well. And also, too, next week, we're going to be hosting the um, Washington State Parks Commission. 
uh, similar to the Park Board and their leadership here in Spokane, uh, which is really exciting. And just recently, too, one of our great uh, friends here in Parks and Recreation that's really close to us, Pete Mayer, was appointed as the director of, of Washington State Parks. So it's going to be great to have that continued collaboration of what we can do in Riverside State Park, the connections, Mount Spokane. Um, so really looking forward to that. Lastly, um, look forward for some communication around our committee and board meetings and transitioning into a hybrid model. Um, we're, uh, per law, we're going to have to have a online hybrid uh, WebEx version moving forward, but we're going to be looking at transitioning into a hybrid model moving forward, so more information to come. With that, that's the end of my report. You did find something to say. Great. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, you know, I said it in the chat, and I'll say it publicly. I think Spokane Parks and Rec is showing leadership to the nation in what they are doing, in the collaborations, in the partnerships, in the work of the staff, just in so many ways. So something I'm very proud to be a part of. Thank you for that. Uh, we have no executive session, and I believe, unless there's anything else for the good of the order, we can bring this meeting to a close. Anybody else have anything? If not, I will adjourn the meeting. It is 5.02. Thank you, everyone, for your time. This was a great meeting, and congratulations again to Parks for such great work. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Take care.